Frank Lucas was born a poor black kid in uh, the rural south, in LaGrange, North Carolina, a town of about two or 3,000. The Country Boys was the nickname that was given to Frank Lucas's crew. They was all out of North Carolina, you know, both crews was out of North Carolina. And, and, and Frank Lucas's crew was called the Country Boys. Uh, the white man ran him out of North Carolina. Well, he came to New York with some big back overalls on, didn't have, I don't know, I guess he must have walked here. I don't know how he came here. The mule kicked him and he went to the house and got the gun and shot the mule and killed him. That was in North Carolina, and a white man's farm, and they ran him out of North Carolina. Finally he ended up uh, in uh, Harlem, barely into his teens, and uh, according to Frank, he uh, ended up at Penn Station and asked somebody, where do all the black people live? and uh, the person said, uh, Harlem. At that particular time in Harlem, uh, all of the buildings that the people lived in were totally and completely neglected. Uh, the city was taking over the buildings. I mean, if there was a fire, uh, if there was a fire, it wasn't repaired. Water hardly made it up to the top floor. It was rat infested. There were no jobs. If you're going to dominate, you got to go where the major market is, and that was in Harlem. And when people talk about New York, they primarily are talking about one borough, and that's Manhattan. Ha Harlem uh, in New York was just full of uh, heroin. And down in uh, uh, lower Harlem, you know, uh, uh, the Italians ruled, and that's where uh, the heroin center was. Okay, blacks are more up around 125th Street. Moving large amounts of dope, uh, dominating the, uh, the scene in Harlem with some, uh, one or two other major heroin traffickers, uh, pushing a lot of heroin on the streets in New York City. Full-scale uh, drug use. And that was, I think, really the advent of open-air drug markets. Harlem, man, Harlem was something. Harlem was, uh, it was like no other place I'd been all over the country. Nothing was like Harlem. It was a 24-hour uh, spot, you know. The city, they, like they said, the city never slept. There was business going 24 hours. There was gambling going 24 hours, partying going 24 hours. Um, most of the people were uh, nightlife people. In the daytime, the only people you saw outside was the numbers guys and, and, and uh, the working guys, you know, that, that worked the uh, supers and, and, and people of that nature. By 1960, uh, there began to uh, have uh, the beginnings of a, a a civil rights movement. When a Negro is born in America, he's dissatisfied, and dissatisfied Negroes know that Mr. Muhammad makes the best spokesman black people can have in this country. A little known story that uh, Mamie on um, Bubby's Will shared with me is that um, when Malcolm X died in 1964, Bumpy went around to all of the businesses in Harlem and said, open up your cash registers because you have to make a donation. And he took a little bit of something from everybody in order to pay for the funeral of Malcolm X. I made a promise to Abraham that he would be a stranger in a foreign land. He would suffer and be afflicted for hundred years. Bumpy donated a lot of money. I don't know how much, because he never would tell me, but he went around to different people's registers and told them, open your register, give me something from Malcolm X. And they meant, they meant something to uh, the black community. We knew them. People in the white community didn't know them. They heard of them. And if you heard of a big drug deal, you just assume automatically it was the mafia or the whites having something to do with uh, this drug dealer. They assumed that the drug dealer who was big in the black community worked for somebody who was white in the mafia. But that wasn't true. You know, when the blacks, you know, once they got into Harlem, it was like, well, you know what? 
But now we're claiming this as ours. Bumpy Johnson was the first who was the independent. He introduced me to Bumpy Johnson, and Bumpy went on, he started talking. You know, he was a tough talking guy, he's no man, but he was a tough talker. Bumpy was getting his package from the mafia because he had those connections. But he was also known as a guy that could go to the Italians and get merchandise. He was the meanest, baddest uh, man in, in, in Harlem. But the mobsters were fair news, wanted something, they wanted to talk to him. Uh, they had a squabble going on. They would come to Bumpy. He would be the, like, the negotiator there and get, make things right. I mean, the luckiest people in the world, I mean, this was, now this was back in the 30s, people were getting evicted left and right. If you were lucky enough to be getting evicted at a time that Bumpy Johnson was strolling by, you were in luck because he never walked by and let the marshals just put your furniture out on the sidewalk. Now, Bumpy used to work for the Italians and then Bumpy went into business himself. And he's the first that I know of who uh, was uh, the man and didn't have to go through the Italians. Uh, you know how you go out shopping? And he said to me he wanted chicken, chicken wings and llama beans for Sunday dinner. And that was never my stick. I always cooked a big roast or turkey or big chicken oven stuff and have a big dinner and have his friends. He said, no. And then we had a, some more friends. That guy's in number business in Harlem right now across the street. He can tell you this. They invited us over to their house that Sunday to have, to, to a picnic. Bumpy didn't want to go. He says, no, I just want uh, some chicken wings and some lima beans and I'm going to rest tomorrow. That was the night he died. Uh, I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and uh, I was given this case to prosecute against Bumpy Johnson. Bumpy died. He died in 68, had, had a heart attack and died in 68. 1968, That's, he died July 7th, and uh, Bobby, Bobby Kennedy died at the same time. Uh, King was the 4th of April, Bobby Kennedy was the 5th of June, Bumpy was the 7th of July. The only thing Frank Lucas would do would meet him downstairs in the front of Lennox Terrace and take Bumpy to the racetrack. Now, where Frank are getting these lies from that he that he uh, stayed in the apartment with Bumpy and Bumpy taught him how to sell drugs, that is a bold face. I don't want to use the ugly word, but it's a bold faced damn lie. There always was hope. There definitely, definitely was hope in spite of, 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 you know, no work, in spite of the drugs. And that hope went away in 1968 when Martin Luther King uh, was shot and killed. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to feed us that day when all of our children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. But you know, we had to have a hero. We didn't have heroes at that time. Uh, when, when, like, in my era, Jackie Robinson was my hero. You could meet anybody up, uh, uh, Juba Dundee, uh, Ali. Muhammad Ali was a hero. Because he stood up to the man. You know, he said, I'm not going to Vietnam. And then they put him in jail, but now they glorify him. He was a hero. They treated us very shabbily in those days, and not so well during these days. I'm not labeling them criminals, but it was, you know, uh, Bumpy Johnson, and it was Thinky Bonds, and it was uh, later uh, uh, Matthews. And the, these people became heroes. 
these people, they defied it. They openly defied the system. A system that wasn't working, by the way. Very, very difficult for uh, a black man to achieve anything in a white society. Uh, I, I guess people came from different neighborhoods. They came from North Carolina, the migration of a lot of African-American families in the, in the uh, 40s and the 30s and the 50s to New York City to get dominant in a certain industry and a trade and the drug traffickers did the same thing. Tonight our reporter Brian Ross has found that the familiar organized mob or mafia now has some competition, particularly in the business of smuggling and selling hard drugs. Competitors who use their own methods to bring their merchandise into this country. Uh, there was there was said to be over 250,000 known heroin addicts and as much as a min million uh, heroin addicts and that wasn't known, okay? So that made a lot of traffic. And there could be 10 crews on one block and all 10 crews would make money. Only a few of them, their names got out in like Nicky Bonds and Frank Lucas to a lesser extent. Uh, Robert Stepney to a lesser extent. Nicky Bonds was the most prolific, uh, well-known, major black heroin dealer in Harlem, name-wise. Frank Lucas was probably his equal or below in the heroin trade. They talk about the country boys, they speak about Frank Lucas. Everybody knew who Frank was. Frank would uh, he'd give, uh, he'd park his Cadillac in the street, but he'd give a couple of kids $5 a piece. No money, chump change to him. It was getting high rod that was between 82 and 90, 90 some percent pure, which you could step on all day and still, you know, um, it would be real good and make a lot of money. And so that's what they was doing. They cut the middle man out. Frank Lucas cut the middle man out by bringing it in from Burma. Now they don't have to, uh, they don't have to go through the, the Guineas, they don't have to go through the Chinese. You know, they direct and they was making money and they was, they was doing a lot of business. The Italians really controlled it in the 60s and uh, late 60s and the early 70s because they had the direct connection with, uh, with France, with the Marseille uh, heroin labs and the uh, French would smuggle it in, into New York or through Canada, Montreal, with the uh, organized crime from Montreal down into New York. And the Italians, mostly from Little Italy, but predominantly from uh, Pleasant Avenue, which is uh, in East Harlem. But there was an Italian stronghold there. And many of those, they controlled the distribution to the blacks and to the Spanish in Harlem out of the Bronx and Pleasant Avenue, Manhattan. Um, when the poppy fields in Turkey got decimated because of uh, President Nixon cracked down on the, or he convinced the uh, government of Turkey to uh, get rid of the poppy fields, that started probably the decline of the uh, Italian stronghold on the distribution of heroin. In the early 70s, heroin addiction was declining in the United States. The number of addicts reached an estimated low of 570,000 in 1973. Now the number is back up to 720,000. There are fears it may soon climb to a million. Helping feed the increase is a resurgence of opium farming in Turkey. Like Frank Lucas, he was, he was dealing with, with a, a homeboy here, Sarge, who was stationed over there in Bangkok. We used to call him the fat man. Leslie Atkinson uh, was, in my opinion, the most important Asian drug trafficker uh, in terms of supply of Asian heroin to the United States uh, in, in that era, for certain. The North Carolina mob is run by men who know a lot about the military. Ten of the top men in this organization are former sergeants in the Army or the Air Force. Federal authorities identify this man as the head of the North Carolina mob. Leslie Ike Atkinson, Goldsboro, North Carolina, former Master Sergeant, United States Army. Uh, there was a transformation uh, from the French connection to um, uh, Middle East and even Southeastern uh, Asian heroin at that point in time. And there was a lot of scurrying around for uh, new sources of supply. 
he made a move and they was using the body bags to get it back in the country. I had been in the military and you know, uh, when a body bag comes back, it's, it's inspected and tagged in, in the port of deportation and it's not touched anymore till it reaches home to the funeral home, whoever picks it up. And, and so that's how they got it in without any problems. Of course, you put it in the coffin. Why? I mean, you're not harming anyone, are you? They are. I mean, half the time you, you, you'll find that uh, that is the best way. Well, we had uh, information in our files uh, of, a, of a fellow uh, named Sutherland who had been um, arrested in the States uh, uh, impersonating himself as a uh, military officer on an aircraft that was bringing um, coffins with uh, dead GIs from, from Vietnam back to the States for burial. So that certainly raised suspicion that that could have been uh, a method of uh, smuggling. However, uh, it was never proven. Now, it could have been a trial run, um, but uh, we never had uh, any evidence. He was an ex-GI, okay, uh, who may or may not have been hooked up. I don't know if there was a relationship between him and Atkinson, but there, there could very well have been, okay? But it showed how uh, black Americans were getting to be major players in the heroin business from their uh, service in Vietnam. I became the, the case agent for the um, uh, Atkinson investigation in 1975, in the, in the, the spring of 1975. And um, although we knew that the Atkinson Jackson group was um, involved with Frank Lucas, um, there was no indication that he was ever operating out of uh, Thailand. In 1971, it had been decided that the U.S. government would give Okinawa back to the Japanese. Jackson was actually arrested in 1972 in, uh, in Colorado as he was receiving a shipment of heroin that um, had been sent uh, to the states from uh, Bangkok. And um, so he was in prison, I think, for 30 years, and it was... Um, uh, Atkinson that actually uh, took over kind of both ends of the operation. We met with this particular drug dealer who was under the protection of a Colonel Pramone. This Colonel was a friend of the US government, a friend of the DEA, uh, and he was sent out of the country on a visit to Washington and the individual that we met undercover, <clears throat> he, we took a letter of introduction from a drug dealer in Okinawa to him. And he met with us and he quietly informed us that um, if you cause me any problems, we'll kill you. I uh, recruited a team of, uh, of uh, Thai citizens to act as uh, surveillance uh, of, the, of the group, the members of the group uh, that we were aware of, to kind of understand their method Last of operation. Last year, Martin Perry directed the federal government's investigation of the North Carolina mob. Perry says law enforcement officials were slow to acknowledge the importance of this new mob because its leaders are black, not mafia members. To start working on these upstarts, on these new people, wasn't interesting because you got the most points for working on a good mafia guy uh, who had been memorialized as a bad guy from way back. Is this network of black, non-commissioned military officers still active today? Oh, yes, I would say so. This is black organized crime? Yes, yes. In a nutshell, that's exactly what it is. There have always been blacks in organized crime operations but never at the top. This new mob has already staked out much of the heroin business for itself, and authorities say it is beginning to use its well-disciplined organization to compete with the mafia in other areas of criminal activity. The North Carolina mob is this country's newest organized crime family. 
the real break came uh, when a, a couple of GIs were arrested in Tokyo with heroin that they had smuggled out of Thailand. Uh, they agreed to cooperate actually with uh, agents in our San Francisco office of DEA. And um, based on that, we were able to identify the individual that introduced those two GIs to um, the, the fellow who actually sold uh, the heroin to them. And we were able to gain the cooperation of that individual who had made the introduction, and he introduced a DEA undercover agent to uh, this uh, source of supply who turned out to be the source of supply for the Atkinson group. Atkinson is now in federal prison, but authorities believe he still runs the North Carolina mob. Uh, again, it's my understanding that um, Herman Jackson and Leslie Atkinson started uh, the operation, and I'm not familiar with any role that Frank Lucas played in those early days, uh, although, again, uh, it's certainly possible. Uh, Frank Lucas and Ike Atkinson. Ike had the connection over in the Golden Triangle because he was a soldier over there. He was related somehow uh, to uh, Frank Lucas, I think by marriage. And now Frank could get his drugs from uh, Ike at dirt costs. And if it say it was $2,000 in um, say Thailand, another $8,000 per kilo uh, for transportation, and you don't bring back one kilo, you might as well bring back 20, 30 kilos. Much cheaper. According to, to what I understand, uh, he was a major uh, distributor of heroin in the New York City area, but did not play a big role, at least in the, uh, the period of time when I was investigating that group in Thailand. And then what they would do, they wouldn't sell a kilo to somebody else. They would take that one kilo, as I said before, Instead of having one kilo at 90%, you'll have 30 kilos at 3%. And if you put $300,000 per kilo times 30, more money than you could count. Listen to me very carefully so you have a crystal clear understanding of how things was. It was a time when Harlem was narcotic central for the eastern seaboard from Maine to Miami and everything east of the Mississippi River. If a motherfucker wanted some heroin, he had to come to Harlem. Boston, Detroit, Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Memphis, Tennessee, Nashville, Atlanta, Delaware, Newark, Atlantic City, Savannah, Miami, Jacksonville, they all had to come to New York because New York City was Narcotic Central. And Narcotic Central in New York City was Harlem, New York. We didn't only set the trend in New York City, we set the trend everywhere. Everybody wanted to wear what Pee Wee Kirkman wore. As long as there was this need for uh, uh, drugs in, in, in the black community, there was someone willing to supply this need. It's a hundred bosses in that area. One hundred, if not more. If, if it wasn't outside the big track, guys looting 200,000 now, you wouldn't really know it. You know how much 500,000 now was back then? These people out here like, like flies, like they were giving out uh, free money. So when that movie came out, Cotton Cover Homes, I was riding the Rolls Royce. It went it, that early. And I, I didn't have a license. I was a kid. I was old enough. They started making money hand over fist. I had two sets of jury. One set of jury basically was for uh, the streets, because I understood how the streets roll, because I'm in the streets, right? And the other set of jury was investments, because people was going over, over in Africa. You understand know what I'm saying? And, 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 and coming back with the diamond. So the way I was buying diamonds was the same way it was the other game. You see what I'm saying? Nikki was the guy, too. Each trying to show each other up in the. Uh in the neighborhoods in Harlem as the, the major guy. Frank would have an entourage of four or five people when he went to the nightclubs, uh, throwing hundreds and hundreds of dollars around. And then Nicky Barnes would be there too. So I think it was probably competition in lifestyle and in the neighborhood for the, for the recognition in the neighborhood. And I think they clashed because of that. So Frank had money, but I just don't know Frank like I know Nick 
was an older, older gangster in the street. Nicky was real, like Bumpy was real. I just didn't know Frank name like that out in the street. You see what I'm saying? I mean, with most people at the top in the same industry, they're egos. And so there's some type of competition going back and forth. But each one was trying to increase market share in their occupation, which was heroin trafficking. Oh, the man did marvelous work, beyond a shadow of a doubt. He got it treetop tall, enjoyed all the finer things in life. But obviously, at some point when I went away, Frank must have got money because I remember a girl, when I came home, a mother, Marguerite Mays, that gave me a, a surprise birthday party. Because I didn't want a birthday party. You know, back then, you didn't want a party when you came home. Not the younger guys, the old heads. That was a thing that they did, right? So when I came home, it was, I was supposed to go to the house for another reason. When I got there, it was a little surprise. And I'm in the bedroom talking to her, and she also. Uh, offered me. She said, I got something for you. I said, what is it? She said, 600,000 ounces. So I said, well, what you mean 600,000? Where would you get 600,000? I'm thinking, she kidding. She said, Frank gave it to me. I'm holding it for him. I'm thinking it was Frank Matthews because he's a money kid, but it was Frank Lucas. I said, oh yeah, because I was a guy that didn't violate the principles of the game, the code of the streets. You never was going to get me to, to, to disrespect a guy for no reason and under no circumstances. So all I'm saying to you is, here's a lady saying, here's 600,000 dollars I'm saying, no, nah, I ain't gonna take this man money. You gotta be kidding. I said, let me say, say something to you. Anybody that's got 600,000 dollars to give you the whole, has got another 10 to have your head taken off. A 30 block area of Harlem, the spies found 18,000 narcotics addicts among the 58,000 residents there. I remember, uh, I think the police officer said, do you know who we are? And uh, the drug dealer says, yeah, but if you ain't out here to buy drugs, get the fuck off the corner. He, uh, Mr. Kissinger and uh, his people uh, who are responsible for narcotic enforcement policy uh, forego that trip to... Uh, uh, Turkey, forego that trip to uh, Switzerland and come down to 116th Street and 8th Avenue. Uh, take his bodyguards and his armored car, and if uh, he doesn't want to, I'll go, I'll walk with him through uh, the streets of Harlem and let them see what is actually going on because the people who are making these policies, I call them the pencil pushers who don't know which end the erasers are on, have never been up there. They don't know what's going on. Now you have to remember these drug dealers are making millions and millions of dollars. They're taking your innocent treasures, your children, and making them drug addicts. They'll give them drugs for free, and they know they have them hooked for the rest of their lives. So they'll give you a turkey for Thanksgiving, or they'll give you some money so you won't be evicted from your house, and the word is that you are a good person. But that was only uh, superficial. The response to this uh, and, uh, to these films has been essentially from three different points of view. Those that were looking at it from the point of view of the destruction of the, 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 the Harlem community. And those that were looking at these individuals as the worst possible kind of uh, individuals. And then there were those that looked at them as heroes also. The drug dealers would uh, ride on this wave of uh, black power and black exploitation that uh, you didn't need uh, uh, the whites. We could do it uh, ourselves, you know? Um, and and uh, that's why uh, the drug dealers in the black community were people of uh, significance. And he might be a drug dealer, but he is our drug dealer. This whole drug thing never was something legal. It always was something illegal. And I think some guys get trapped into doing it so long that they begin to think that, 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 that they're legal and the cops ain't legal. The one thing that Barnes and Lucas have in common is both of them come from backgrounds of extreme poverty and, and, and neglect, you understand? That money never found its way back in, so there just was this total feeling of neglect. The role models were the people who they found in the community, in the streets. I came on during the heels of the Vietnam War. A lot of my personal friends went to Vietnam as 18, 19-year-olds and came back addicted to heroin. 
and these were kids that we just would go to parties, hang out with the girls, and now they were heroin addicts. And DEA was formed, and I went in there as a single mission because I'm going to now arrest the major narcotic dealers that ruined the lives of all my friends growing up in the projects in New York City. Out the 60s and 70s, we watched these communities deteriorate. They didn't deteriorate, and these communities were destroyed by drug dealers. These communities were destroyed by governmental neglect, right? economic neglect. All the jobs fled to the suburbs, and we're seeing this in, 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 now we're seeing what happened to Harlem at the end of the 60s and going into the 70s, the deterioration of these communities. We're seeing this in, 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 in industrial communities all across this country. Families destroyed. You know the heartbreak of a family when their son or daughter, 14 years old, uses heroin and dies? That family is never the same. Never the same. This is the feud between Frank and Nikki, reputation. And they were both operating in the same playground, basically, Harlem. Harlem was their center. Harlem is where they lived. Harlem is where the, the neighborhood saw these people, but their distribution chain was up and down the eastern seaboard. Lucas was known, but I don't think, in, in my opinion, uh, that he was on that same level as uh, Nikki Bonds or, or a, um, a Frank Matthews. I think he... He was a significant dealer, don't get me wrong. I, 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 he had his uh, areas of, uh, of uh, trade, but I don't think uh, realistically you could put him quite the same level as Bonds or, or Matthews at that time. Uh, there came a time when we, we received intelligence from UID, Unified Intelligence Division, which was a unit of the Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, and they told us that, that uh, the country boys were looking at Wacknicky. And Frank had the temerity, he put out a contract on Mickey. Sent me to uh, Rackers Island, to ACM, to the maximum security block on 1B. They brought the Frank Lucas dude in, but just prior to him coming in, we had got uh, a, a newspaper article about his case, and in that newspaper article, it also stated something about he had a contract on Nicky Bonds. I asked him actually, um, "You got a problem with you got a problem with Nick with, with, with Nick?" And this motherfucker was scared. This motherfucker was scared to death in there, and said, "Nah, me and Nick is the best of friends." You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and with, with, with the little trembling lip shit. And there came a moment when I asked, "Yes, yes, what's this thing about the uh, you know the country boys looking at whack Nicky?" And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? I had worked with Jones and Abruzzo prior to going to the Essex County uh, Bureau of Narcotics. When I went to Essex County, Jones and Abruzzo were already working on this group called the Country Boys. Well, I was a member of uh, the North Narcotics Squad uh, with my partner. Uh, Detective uh, Benny Abruzzo. Uh, we had gotten a uh, number of complaints in from the uh, police director that the citizens in the area of Howard Street projects and West Kenny projects couldn't come out uh, because of the narcotics uh, taking place at the time. Myself and Eddie Jones were our partners in the North Police Narcotics Squad, and we developed some informants that gave us information. Uh, that a group of guys were in the projects and they were selling drugs and they were selling good quality drugs and um, they were known as the country boys. Jones and Abruzzo then approached me and asked me if I could assist them in getting them transferred up to the Essex County Bureau of Narcotics and work with them on the investigation. Shorty, who was known as Vernon Lee Lucas, was getting his drugs from New York City from his brother, his older brother, Frank Lucas. All of the guys that were involved in this were called the Country Boys. That's what we had dubbed their names. Um, all of the brothers who were involved were, had the last name of Lucas. 
Shorty Lucas was the main guy in the New Jersey area that we knew of. Once um, Detective Jones and Abruzzo had secured the drugs and secured Eddie James, they were able to flip him before they even walked out of the door. There was about approximately seven and a half pounds of heroin, and when we submitted it for analysis, we found out that it was basically 80 to, to 90 percent pure. We had secured, I think it was about seven arrests and all of the drugs, which was about $20 million worth of pure heroin. We placed James under arrest, and we began talking to him, and uh, he basically said, listen, I'm going to give you everything. And uh, at that point, he went on to tell us uh, who was implicated, who was going to come in the morning to, uh, to uh, bag up the drugs. And so at that point, we told Spearman. Spearman called Richie Roberts, who was home in bed at the time, and then told him, to, uh, to get the warrants ready because we were going to hit all the locations that we had from uh, Mr. James. Richie Roberts did not give us the appropriate credit that he should have given us. He could have, he could have mentioned our names uh, on some of his interviews. Uh, even now he's doing interviews and still not saying um, too much about the detectives who actually did the job. It's like we were just there. Uh, through his testimony and through the testimony of another informant, Richie Roberts was able to gain the indictment of 34 other people, Frank Lucas being one of the 34 other people. Now, Frank Lucas was already been arrested in New York by the New York detectives, by the DEA and the New York detectives. Well, we, uh, DEA and New York City Police Department, uh, Organized Crime Control Bureau detectives, had formed an ad hoc uh, task force to work a major heroin case uh, against the Gambino crime family. Uh, we um, were successful in arresting several of these uh, uh, major suppliers, uh, organized crime guys who uh, were supplying dealers uh, in uh, Harlem and in East Harlem. And uh, as a result of that investigation, uh, we received information that um, uh, Frank Lucas had been doing business with these uh, uh, members of uh, organized crime and uh, had received a, a number of um, uh, heroin packages, shipments from these uh, individuals uh, over the uh, last uh, several years. At one point we were working with um, Sterling Johnson, who I think he was a New York Manhattan District, or, yeah, Manhattan District Attorney. We um, had different locations in New York where they were cutting uh, we continued to, to work the investigation right up until the time of the trial. The trial lasted, I would say, about, I think it was six weeks. At that time, I sat next to Richie Roberts throughout the six-week period because Richie Roberts didn't know who was who. Frank Lucas was taken down by DEA and the New York City Police Department in 1975. We got the information from uh, both of these individuals uh, who had decided to cooperate uh, with the government upon their arrest. Uh, we took that information to uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, we went before a judge and uh, were authorized a search warrant for uh, Frank Lucas's uh, residence in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey. And after receiving that uh, search warrant, uh, a group of um, NYPD detectives and uh, DEA agents uh, went out to uh, New Jersey and we uh, executed that search warrant at uh, Lucas's house uh, uh, in the evening. Shortly thereafter, uh, in the backyard, a uh, window opened uh, on the first floor and several um, uh, gym bag uh, uh, type of um, uh, uh, luggage uh, came out the window, thrown out the window. Uh, we brought the uh, money inside later, had a chance uh, to uh, count the money, and um, uh, if I remember correctly, it, it, it totaled at the end of the night about $584,000 in cash. All the luxuries of life that a motherfucker in the game strive for, but in the end, it don't count. Because the nigga told man, it don't count when you rat, player. And he received a 40-year sentence and then a 30-year on top of that. 
and he appealed it. The conviction, I believe, was in 76. In 1977, the appeal was turned down, and at that point, he was looking at 70 years, and he approached the United States Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York to see if he could get a reduction in his sentence by cooperating. And that's when I became personally involved in him. Well, Nicky Barnes and Frank Lucas were both operating around the same time. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure the sequence of events, but both wind up going to jail at, at around the same time also. I think Frank may have went to jail uh, first, and then Nicky may have went to jail probably at about uh, 1977. Well, when somebody like that offers to cooperate, you don't immediately jump into bed with them and say, okay, but you have to listen to them to see what they have to say and to see if you can run with it, you corroborate what they're saying. So it's a give and take point. And at some point, the United States Attorney's Office made a decision that they would um, uh, follow whatever he was willing to uh, offer us. And we, that's when we got involved in the DEA. Literally become a, a snitch nation. <laughs> You know, where, where uh, if you see something, say something has become uh, 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 where we're heading. Yeah. He was a prolific heroin dealer, and he did still have connections. He would, even though the word was out, sort of, that he was cooperating, he still had the uh, the ability to ability to uh, to convince people on the street that he wasn't and he could make introductions. You no, know, we, we, I remember as a, as a kid going to school, you know, uh, learning about Benedict Arnold, you know, America's, uh, one of America's first traitors, you know. If they put that label on you, it'd be in a Benedict Arnold, you know. It's something they taught in grade school. I'm not gonna answer another question. You just, because I'm not under arrest and I'm gonna walk out. As the story goes that they arrested Herbie and he was in one room and they had arrested his mother for violation of federal narcotics laws, and she was in another room. And that the agents told Herbie, 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 we, we have your mother. She's under arrest for violation of narcotics laws, federal narcotics laws, but we can do some deals if you would cooperate. And as the story goes, Herbie looked the agents in the eye and said, my mom can do her time. Now you fast forward to the 90s and the year 2000, and you see the advent, uh, the breakdown in organized crime, where John Gotti's trusted number two, Sammy Gravano, realized that the government was his best friend in terms of making a deal to get out of 19 murders and, uh, and walked out of federal prison, only to commit crimes and go back again. Uh, but nowadays, nobody wants to go to jail. You have a generation that says, well, I don't like this guy anyway, and if I have to give him up or give up the organization to get out, I'm gonna get out. Someone like him, specifically, he was doing 70 years. So what they would first do is see if he could, um, if he would tell on everybody in his organization, and then you would put together a conspiracy case while he's in jail, not while he's out. The cooperation with uh, law enforcement is always a sensitive subject, and uh, it's, it's something that law enforcement uh, needs to further the investigation, but it's something that you really don't want to talk about. Uh, uh, when people cooperate, because for the obvious reasons, you know, uh, you, you don't want to really talk about that. But uh, suffice to say that the only way, one of the few ways to reduce a long prison sentence is that you cooperate and you cooperate fully. And the more information and evidence you give, you will increase the chances of shaving off significant jail time off your sentence. And uh, I, I think during that time, Frank was facing 70 years. Uh, I think uh, Nicky Barnes, when, when he was convicted, he was life in prison, and uh, this is the 1970s. Uh, as far as I know, they weren't given those Paris Hilton kind of deals where you can get out if you had a headache. And Seeing all that about, you know, people testifying against cops and things like that, let me tell you something, man. When you understand the code of the game, man, you look at that wit, that, 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 that stand, and you see somebody sitting on that stand testifying against somebody, the one thing you know that's embedded in your mind Till the day you die, you you don't know what's gonna happen with your life. None of us can predict the future, but you know one thing is for certain that you're never, ever, ever gonna see yourself on that stand. Never in a million years. You understand? Know I'm saying? I'm testifying against nobody. See, a businessman makes this best business decision. 
So when he is confronted with a situation, whether to get three years or 10 years, he makes a business decision. I'm gonna get three years. And he's not willing to suffer the consequences of his action. See, I came up in the world where my loyalty is to the life that I live, not to an individual, not to an organization, but my loyalty is to the life that I live. And the life that I live is that you hold your water under any and all circumstances. Sometimes you make decisions with other people who wind up not strong, weak, soft as cotton, but that's on you, man. That's a decision you made. And you can't let their weaknesses determine your decisions. And you hold your water, man, when the time comes. No, make no mistake about it. The top people in the narcotics industry, this is a business to them. And the business is making money. And there is really no loyalty. It's all about money, okay? And they make business decisions. If the decision is that I cooperate, if I tell what I know, I will get out of jail, people make a business decision to get out of jail. Question, no, we wouldn't let them out on the street to cooperate, to uh, uh, try to drum up business, as, if you will. Uh, he would, he had a knack, like I said before, for convincing people on the phone. He worked the phones all day long while in jail, trying to convince people on the street that he would never give them up, and would he, would they meet one of his people who would be an undercover DEA agent. But when they come after you and investigate you, the penalties are gonna be at the highest level. And one of the few ways of getting out from under that sentence is cooperation. Listen, when I was a young man, my first major narcotic bust, two black police had me in the precinct. I'm fly, they fly. They had a store named A.J. Lester. We had all fly shit on. And they playing me. I ain't mad at them. They got a job to do. They trying to use psychology. Yo, brother, you understand? Don't you, you know, the white man bring a thing in the country. Don't you be a victim. I said, man, I don't have nothing to say. So they kept on, kept on, which is their job. I ain't mad at them. They, they got to pay for their kid teeth, their mortgage, their health insurance. Do you, play it? Don't involve me. And he would also come up with information from talking to people. Again, he was constantly on the phone from jail with people that he knew and trusted on the outside who would trust him. You could help us, help you, help us, help you. You could help yourself. I say, player, I don't have nothing to say. So after a while, I said, you know something, man, give me a pencil and paper. They went there, was running all around in the room, get a pencil and paper, maybe he ready to cooperate. And I put on the paper, I have nothing to say. And I held it up. Police smacked the shit out of me. But they stopped bothering me. But they smacked the shit out of me, though. Whatever time he gave you, knew what this game was about. Just deal with the time that he gave you. Let's face reality, man. You was who you was. Like the young kids say nowadays, it is what it is, man. I'm going to put it to you like this. Uh, if, if you have a long jail sentence and your jail sentence is cut dramatically, obviously you had to get some good information. With him, it was a number of years after he uh, was in jail and the people that he was dealing with were either um, the Italians had already cooperated themselves and they're the ones that actually gave up Frank, his sources of supply and the others were either gone, dead, or also in jail. Well, with Barnes and Lucas, you know, they're part of that same element. You know, Lucas was betrayed, and then he turned around and became a betrayer. You know, Barnes felt that he was betrayed, and he turned around and, you know, sought revenge, and thus he became a betrayer. You know? hey, let me say this about Nicky. Sure, when I, when I you know, look at the clips of that movie. I don't, I see Nicky more than that because Nicky was a guy, or one of the older guys, there was a couple of older guys. I mean, these guys was was guys that you had to respect this hustling back then. You understand what I'm saying? Because if I'd have looked at the shit that you talk about today, I never would have been in the game in my life. And that's part of what made me get out of the game and understood I was never getting back in the game because I seen the principles and the code of the game start to deteriorate and go down. And now, while when I was again in the game, a guy went away and he came home, we gave him a piece of money. When the guy, when I, we made sure his wife was all right, we never would violate that code. We never would disrespect people. We never would let nobody else disrespect you. If you ain't in the street to, 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 to handle your man, then we handle it for you. You handle yours when you went away, we handle everything in the street till you came out. Anytime you have an organization, my experience, 
that is doesn't have any moral code or a code of conduct it's all about money it's going to crash sooner or later and that's what happened in drug organizations because it'll crash internally because people will may get addicted to the drugs they may steal the profits it's going to can crash from the outside because not only is the New York City Police Department looking at these guys, but the DEA is looking at these guys, and other police agencies throughout the state are looking at these guys. So sooner or later, with all that intense scrutiny, internal and external, the organization is going to crash. And then when it does crash, the penalties are so high, especially on the federal level, on the minimum mandatories because of the Organized Crime Control Bill, that the only departure from the sentencing guidelines is cooperation. One of the few ways to get out is cooperation. What usually happens in situations where trust is betrayed, betrayal begets betrayal. So when things start to change and, and guys start to disrespect one another all over about women, and, 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 and I mean, it was ridiculous. I knew the game was over. You know what I'm saying? I knew it was history. Then the next thing you know, the stitching came. But Nikki, the Nikki that I know, was a stand up, hard rock, original badass. You know what I'm saying? Nikki, it wasn't nothing weak about Nikki. And I know a lot of people don't like me saying this, but you know, I got to tell it like it is. I don't give a damn what nobody like. If I put my word on, like I said, I put my life on. Nikki was original badass. There's no question. So Nikki, in a way, ironically, ambiguously, he fortified another principle. Violate honor, violate morals, violate the principles that we have. Treat each brother as you treat yourself. Hmm? Well, he wasn't treated like that. They dishonored him. Loyalty and trust was important, as it's important in any relationship. You know, I mean, whether it's between a uh, parent and child, a husband and wife, uh, you know, friends, uh, business partners, you know, at the core of every relationship is the element of trust. That's number one, because there cannot be no relationship without trust. But the reality is, is he got caught in a situation that nobody can convince me Nikki wouldn't have did life over life over life because Nikki wasn't about that. But he got caught in a situation where in his mind he felt like whatever kind of agreement he had with the people he was, that they violated the agreement, they shouldn't have did the things he did, and they got to look back at that and, and ask themselves, should they have done it? Because he let that flip him over. Now, me, it would have never flipped me over, but I might, you know, I can't, I can't speak for another man because I ain't, if I ain't going to, wear another man's shoes, speak out another man's mouth. I'm not, because I'm not going to lay in another man's grave. Be honest with ourselves, you know, the worst thing, that the thing that we find uh, most painful and hurtful is when we're betrayed by somebody that we trust. Isn't that true? I think it's true. Like a chain reaction, you know. You betray me, I get revenge. My revenge... Uh, incorporates uh, uh, betrayal of you. Maybe that's the way for me to get back at you, you know. As a result of being dishonored, Nikki saw the only justice that he could was to get back at them. The only way he could get back at them because he was in the joint was to inform, okay? Now, if Nikki was out on the street, it would have been a different story, all right? He would have whacked half of these guys. He would have took a baseball bat to them and sought his own justice that way. So now you have What's, it, what's really the difference in some respects? He got justice, but if he would have been in the street, it would have been a different kind of justice. But in the joint, that was the only kind of justice he could have gotten. So without having uh, passing any moral judgment on anybody or, or whatever, you know, I'm opposed to betrayal. You know, trust is very important to me in every relationship, you know. And uh, if I detect any, any deviation, I mean, uh, any... If I have any reason to doubt the trust of a person I'm in a relationship with, I generally end those relationships. So whatever Nikki did is on Nikki. Only Nikki understood why he, why he did what he did. I only understood the Nikki before he did what he did. I don't know that other Nikki. You know what I mean? And when I, but I, I see them kids guy, and I, you know, your heart go out. I mean, some of them are new little kids in the street when I left. You know. That's why they have divorces. You know, you know. And that's why people go to court and 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 and. and, and uh, fight their way out of contracts or, you know, they don't want to do business with people anymore. It's simply because there's been a, uh, you know, the element of trust, there's some question about it. No, it didn't change the rules because mm -hmm. the rule is you don't inform. And again, I think we, we made it clear here that Nikki informed for other reasons. But still, informing, flipping on your people for a better deal is always a no-no. Never.
In the case of Barnes, who I know personally, you know, I didn't know Lucas to that degree. He was betrayed. He, according to him, he was betrayed by his, 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 the mother of his children. He was betrayed by his girlfriend. He was betrayed by his protege, you know, Guy Fisher. He was betrayed by a guy that he befriended and showed love, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson. You know. All four of these people came into his life as a result of his own choices. Now, that's got a difficult thing to live with there, man. You know, uh, to accept the fact that you made bad decisions. It's a complicated thing because maybe they felt justified in doing what they did, and uh, I don't know what the case may be, you know. But uh, when you make bad decisions, sometimes you have to live with them. <laughs> you have to live with them. You can't go around blaming the whole world for your bad decisions, man. You made bad decisions, you know what I'm saying? They came back and bit you on your ass. You understand? Maybe you might, you know, you had two options there. You either accept that, you understand what I mean, or deal with it. And uh, I guess you chose to, he chose to uh, use the federal government to get back at them. Which all comes behind one of the most formidable forces in the street, respect. Respect. You disrespected me. If you want trust, and loyalty, then you need to give trust and loyalty. You know what I'm talking about? The worst kind of informant is the guy that flips for a deal. That's the guy who's the worst, okay? Frank flipped for a deal, from what I know. Put a guy in a cell 23 hours a day, and, uh, and all his pills are exhausted. You know, I think you need to be a little more concerned about how you treat that person, you know. Betrayal is a two-way street. It don't just happen out of nowhere, All right? And that said, uh, I'll probably be misinterpreted and misunderstood here like everybody else. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, man, you know, the abused child becomes the abuser, man. The most wickedest lie you could ever tell in your entire life is the one that you tell to yourself. We see idleness. Uh, we see idleness. And this is the results of poverty, lack of opportunity, failed public schools, and a governmental system that doesn't really, really doesn't give a damn what happens to these kids. You know, their response to them is to lock them up, throw away the key, you know, uh, turn their communities into open air prisons. And what do you think these kids are going to do? Huh? What do you think they're going to do? Think they're all gonna end up on a football field, a basketball court, huh? Or they're gonna be all rap stars? No, they're not. They're gonna fill the prisons, and they're going to follow the same track that you have always followed. When there's no opportunity, they're gonna to try to find a way to get some. You know, I mean, you keep bombarding them with these advertisements every day. You know, uh, these big cars, these mansions, you know, these clothes, diamonds, beautiful women, you know, you know trips all around the world, and all, all day long you're feeding them this, at the same time, you're not showing them how to get there, you're not giving them the means to get there, you know, you're saying this is success, you know, 
It's a 10-foot wall, and they got a 5-foot ladder. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to do the same thing that Barnes, Lucas, Al Capone, uh, Lucky Luciano, and all the rest of the gangsters that you glorify in your your movies and media, the Sopranos. <laughs> You know, they're going to do the same things. They're going to try to find innovative ways to get to that level of success. And y'all got a chance to date. Today, the young generation to date is the fastest growing money making legally than they ever been. My message to young people is you can do it. All us can do it. You understand what I'm saying? This game is not a death sentence. When you make a mistake going to life of crime as a kid, you just made a mistake. Could be the conditions, could be you following somebody else. That's not your life, kid. You go to jail, sit down and watch the, that brick wall sit and watch them bars after a while. You can come back out and be another person. Don't let n- one, two, three felonies hold you back. You come, But you can't come out bitter. You can't come out mad. You can't come out thinking that the world owes you something. Don't nobody owe you shit. They didn't owe me nothing. I made my choice. I ain't never complained in the joint to nobody one time.